Well, Chris, it's great to see you, and I'm so glad you're back home with your family. Thank you very much. It's good to be seen, <laughs> and it's good. It's definitely good to be home, that's for sure. How are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. It's, it's, a, it's a, progression, a progression that happens day by day, and every day I feel stronger, I feel better, and I'm, I had certain goals set for every day for what I wanted to accomplish, and I'm knocking those things out every day. And Chris, when did this start? When did you first start feeling sick? Uh, I was at a conference in San Francisco. Um, they, they announced a state of emergency, and quite frankly, they should have shut that conference down. Uh, but on the flight home, I felt like a truck hit me. Uh, and um, so I, uh, you know, at that point, you, I couldn't, it hurt to carry my laptop bag back to my driver. So I knew at that point something was off. And what day was that? That what was uh, that was Friday night. Okay. And then by Sunday, I was having the shortness of breath. And then Monday, the canary in the coal mine popped up, and it was 102 degree fever. So that's when I said, "Okay, this this is all three symptoms." I was over there where it was kind of a hotbed. Let me go to the doctor. Now, prior to this, you'd been. I assume watching the news and keeping up with the coverage, did you think that you would be at risk for this? Well, once I hit the fever, I actually walked right into my doctor's office and asked for a test. Um, but because we've had such a bad flu season and because no one in Connecticut had had it before, they were treating me like I had the flu. And so, and I understand that. And, you know, even got to Wednesday where, um, you know, I had the, the pneumonia, and I had a chest x-ray. And so, you know, I got antibiotics like they normally would do and inhalers and things like that. But I just, by, by Friday, I was done. I had never, I had never felt like that before in my entire life. Uh, but so by Friday, it was, it was very clear I needed to go to the ER. So that was a week into it at that point? Yeah, a whole week. So I basically had a whole week of 102 degree fever, which is rare for an adult to have, to have 102 degree fever that long. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then by then I could barely breathe. Um, even when they, when I, when I got into the ER on the gurney and they put the mask on with the albuterol, even with that, it was hard for me to breathe. And so I, <laughs> I remember sitting there going, okay, something, I, I really must have this. Okay. So then Friday, here you are a week into it. And Friday, is that when you get admitted? Yeah, I get admitted. And it was interesting. This one doctor, I can't remember who she is. But um, I wanted to go to use the bathroom. And so it was right across the hall. And I go creeping out that door. And she's like, ah, get back in your room. She says, there's a bathroom in your room. And I said, OK. And, and she says, you were in San Francisco, right? I said, yeah. She goes, You've, you don't feel too good, right? I'm like, yeah, no, I don't. She goes, back in your room now. And they literally put stuff in front of my, my door. And they said, no one's admitted. No one's allowed in or out. Uh, and so I know, uh, and so I was very appreciative of the fact that she was like, okay, she believed that I had it. And sure enough, that's when they gave me the test. The infectious disease doctor came in, Dr. Nee, super cool guy, uh, came in, gave me the test and they, it was confirmed COVID. So this was at Danbury hospital. Danbury hospital. And they promptly at that point rushed my wife out of the hospital. She didn't get a chance to say goodbye to me. They were like, you know what? You need to go. So you don't, and go quarantine yourself because you've been exposed. And uh, you've got two babies at home, so get out of here. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, she had to, you know, imagine, you know, we have all these friends in this area, in Wilton and Richfield. She couldn't ask anyone to come over to help. And she's got, you know, you very well know how much work twins are. And now she's also coordinating care for a disease that no one in the state has. has and now they've got to start figuring out what's going to work for, for this brain, for this body to get rid of this thing. But here you are, you're, you're laying in the hospital and, and they tell you, you are essentially patient zero for the state of Connecticut. What was going through your mind at that moment? Well, you got to be first at something. And the way I view it is, you know, um, if anybody's going to get it, you know, let it be me. Um, because one thing about uh, me and my family is we're fighters. And I figured, you know what? Uh, it is what it is. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't go back and, oh, if only this, if only that. I think we're in society today, we're too much of a shoulda, woulda, coulda. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's where we are now. So now we have to treat it. And, and so I just kind of was like, all right, what do we do next? 
And then after that, I was knocked out for 10 days. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so was there a was there a conversation about that? Did they say to you, we're going to put you in a coma or did it just? No, no I think I just, I, I think I, like when I got there Friday, like I said, here I am with a mask with albuterol and coming to my lungs and I couldn't breathe. And I think they, they also measure your blood oxygen level. That little pull socks thing that you can buy, that is gold. Uh, if you can get one, if you can find one of those things, um, but it, it started showing, you know, my blood oxygen levels dropping still. Wow. And uh, I know that at one point I dropped to where like, it looked like you have like liver failure. Mm. Um, that's what the, what, what my discharge paperwork has shown. So at that point I was in acute respiratory failure and I was, they, they, they had me and I was in their hands at that point. So you don't even remember that. I don't even remember. I, I remember in the gurney being taken around. And I remember a guy in a red shirt walking us through the ER and walking us to a spot. And I remember nothing beyond that. So at what point did they put you under? You got admitted Friday. When did they do that? From what I understand that timeline, I think it was sometime that coming into that Saturday morning okay. is when they were either that. I think they watched me for a day and then that's it's that weekend that I was put under. What was your biggest fear during all of this? I wouldn't see my boys again. Uh, my boys would grow up without a father. Uh, I, I, I think for the first time in my adult life, I was truly scared. And it's because of all the unknowns. You know, there was no protocol for it. Uh, all I had read, of course, was bad news about it. And all you see was bad news about it. So, you know, you don't, hear of people like me who got out and the other hundreds, by the way, that day by day come out. Uh, you know, all you thought was it was a death sentence. And I'm living proof it's not. Yeah. I think that's an important message for people to hear right now. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, if your family member has it, um, it is scary. And if you're somebody who has it and you're sitting there in the hospital watching this interview, um, you know, it's not a death sentence. You can get through it. Uh, be patient with your nurses and doctors because th they're trying to limit their exposure to you as well. And try to make your interactions with them as human as possible. They're under a lot of stress and they see the full gamut of this thing. They're seeing the good, you know, someone like me who gets to heal and go home. And they also see the bad side of it. And they may see that, they may flip flop between that and then have to come deal with you. And so, um, you know, all that PPE gear that they have to put on and all that stuff, um, I tried to make my interactions with the doctors and the nurses as pleasant. Uh, once my sense of humor started coming back after the coma, uh, I, I tried to make them laugh if I could or make them smile um, because, you know, they're important. They're on the front lines and quite frankly, they're risking their lives for us. So, you know, for family that you can't be there, once they come out of the coma, give them a call you know, and, and talk to them. That was one thing that helped me is calling my mom or calling my wife or calling friends. I still had my, I could get, once I could be strong enough to hold my cell phone to my face without it whacking me in the head, you know, when you're in the bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That happened a couple of times because my hands weren't strong enough. Once I got to the point where I could hold it up for a bit um, and have a conversation that really did help. Lift your spirits. Yeah. Um, and then Chris, what would your message be right now to all the healthcare workers that are out there on the front lines right now dealing with this every day? Thank you so much. And know that um, there are people out there right now that are innovating new technologies, new things for you. Uh, they are thinking about you. Um, uh, and there are people that are, uh, I know that there, there are manufacturers that are changing from making shirts to gowns. The PPE is going to come eventually, um, but the, the biggest thing for me is, is that it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better, but you can make it through it and to take care of yourselves too. Um, if you burn out and you get sick, then you're just another patient. And um, so if, if you, you know, pace yourself, take care of yourself and know that people like me who are home, we're holding our children, we're walking around we appreciate your hard work. And if we could help somehow, we would. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm still trying to think of a way, how do I give back? And so I've got a couple of things in motion so that I can do that. 
Um, but I know myself, that's what I'm thinking about right now. What's, what's something that I could do to help these individuals? And if you know somebody who is a first responder, a doctor or a nurse, and you know it's their day off, buy them dinner, buy them lunch, you know, do something for them, wash their car. Um, they, they need, even if it's something that mundane, they need something like that so that they can just relax on their day off. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know what your first memory is after waking up and all the things you had to relearn from that point. So <laughs> I'm trying to think of, I'll tell you what my first, my first memory was when I did wake up. It was about a couple hours after I woke up. I remembered I had a dog. And I wanted to see my dog. And that's one thing, you know, that I remembered. Um, it took a conversation with my wife to realize I had children. And a wife. Yeah, and, and a wife, yes. And, and what was interesting is that the, uh, the ER, of the um, intensive care unit, my wife had emailed over pictures of my boys. And they had printed up and put pictures of the boys on the, on the wall. And so when she told me, and she said, look on the wall. And there they were. There were my kids. And that was, an, that was another memory that came back. I remember that photo shoot that we took. I remember, then I started remembering their birth. I remember going with them into the NICU. And so my brain was slowly but surely shuffling all these things back together. So uh, crazy enough, it was my dog, uh, then my kids, then my wife. <laughs> okay, reverse order of importance there. Yeah, I know. Maybe, maybe don't publish that. <laughs> Um, uh, wow. Um, and so what, if any, what, if any residual, uh, effects are you feeling from this things you're still working through? So, uh, not to scare anyone, but, um, there were, even when I was discharged and I got the double negative test, which is what they give you, uh, there were still some short-term memory issues, but I've, I've kind of overcome that now. They are gonna be doing a brain scan because they think that I may have lost a little bit of oxygen. And they think that I may have had some mini strokes due to the fever, the two weeks of 102. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's not confirmed. And I don't have the data on that just yet. So we could do the MRI and come to find out. None of that happened. It was just a matter of my brain needing to put things back together. And so I've been doing little things to try to bring up memories like, uh, the Tuesday, I came back on Monday. That Tuesday, I sat and played all my music from my childhood. You know, so all, um, I'm a childhood, a child of the 80s and 90s, so I'm playing all that music. And I'm, I'm trying to remember the, not only the music, but the first time I heard it, the emotion behind it, if I was with a friend. And I remember my friend had this really weird car that when he accelerated, it sounded like a bird was in the engine. And I remember hearing a certain song and we both were like screaming and yelling like a 16 year old kids. And I remember hearing the bird and all that, you know, that kind of recollection was helping me kind of walk down memory lane. So I was able to walk back from my teenage years all the way up to, to now with music. And that really helped me a little bit. So I think some of these exercises I'm doing for my brain, they're definitely helping me with my articulation. Uh, had you interviewed me a week ago, I was kind of slurring my speech a little bit. I was a little slower to articulate things. Um, and so that has now dissipated because I've been doing some different exercises. So it's, it's very possible that nothing's there, but that's the only thing that's residual. And then obviously strength. Um, you know, when you're, when you, you know, wake up, you can't even hold a glass of water to your mouth. Um, you know, and so it, it takes a while. Like I told you, I, I think I had a goal, came back on a Monday, went by Friday, I wanted to be able to hold one of my children, be able to walk it back to the crib and put it down and feel confident to do that. Did and you I did. It? You did it. Yeah, I did. And so now, you know, the other day I was holding both <laughs> and felt comfortable holding both of those little tanks. So <laughs> the strength slowly but surely comes back as you use it. But uh, yeah, I, I would say the, the muscle atrophy was, was the hardest thing. And, and it's the little tiny muscles that you, you know, you don't think you have, you know, mm -hmm. until you either pull it and strain it or you right. actually need to engage it to, to, you know, drink water. Yeah. And you look different now too, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. I lost, I lost around 25 pounds because, you know, for a while I just couldn't eat. And then even when I came back, um, 
I didn't know how to eat. I didn't know how to swallow. So they actually have uh, an, an individual that comes in there. His name was Chris. He was a super cool guy. And uh, he, he kind of made me earn glasses of water. Um, I had little biscuits that I had to answer questions and then I could chew and he would help me chew and then I could drink and swallow. And so he kind of walked me through that process so that I could safely feed myself. Wow. Um, yeah. So for a bit, it's just like yogurts and things like that. So, you know, for a big guy like me, a couple yogurt a day, is, you know, uh, is not going to be enough. You had to learn how to eat, drink, walk and talk all over yes. again. Walk all over again. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, and it's interesting. Uh, I think back to all the injuries I had as a kid, springing my ankles multiple times, breaking my ankles. All that instability is coming back when you're sitting there trying to stand for the first time. And I'll, there, it was me and uh, Favre. I, I call the, the PT guy there. Brett. He looks like an older version of Brett Favre. And he had to wrap this belt around me. And, and we had to hold each other and hug each other and go one, two, three. And I stood up. And I think I may have done three steps. And then I fell back into a wheelchair. Oh. And that was PT for the day. I was white. Wow. And then the following week, he was able to help me walk across the room. And then the following week after that, or a couple of days after that, I was walking across the room by myself. Uh, I, since, I, since I knew that the nurses were limiting their exposure, I used that opportunity to strengthen my legs and pr slowly but surely progress, prog progress my strength to be able to walk on my own all across the room. That's incredible. So, so from the time of admission to the time you woke up from the coma is like 10, 11 days. Yeah. And then you we're in the hospital a total of 20, you think? Okay. Close to 20 or, or just over 20. Mm -hmm. So in a week and a half, you made incredible leaps and bounds with your recovery. <laughs> that's like, that's amazing. How has this experience changed you fundamentally as a person? Um, I was a workaholic before. I, I was a little bit out of balance, I would say. And so I definitely, um, I'm definitely seeing that I could put things in better balance. Number one, I needed to take care of myself. The fact that I had to lose 25 pounds because of the fact that I wasn't taking care of myself uh, was sad. And so I realize now that health is wealth and my own health matters. Uh, so I've devised a little routine that I do in my office. It takes 10 minutes and that's it. It's, it's all I can do probably all I'm going to be able to do for a while with twins and a job and all that fun stuff. So, but, but it's something. And you know what it was for me as I, I had this mentality, well, if I can't go do all of this, all, if, if, I, if I couldn't achieve perfection, I didn't do anything. And here I wasn't following the advice of my own, in my, in my business, uh, perfect is the enemy of good. Get it out there, get it going. And I was too much of a perfectionist. So I wouldn't even start something if I couldn't do it perfect. Mm. That's ridiculous right? Take care of your health. Family is, is after your health, because then at that point, if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your family. And then the job, it, it's there, right? I have a great job. I have a wonderful company. They were so supportive. The CEO was texting my wife every other day. I Can mean, just fiber security, you were saying? Yeah, the company's called Exavine. They're amazing. Um, but, you know, I, I, I need to put them in, in the proper order. Mm -hmm. And I think I know sitting in that hospital bed, I'm like, you were out of balance. You, you didn't have things in proper order. And so I know when I go back, I'm just going to be more balanced with, with some decision making that I make. Do you think there's a parallel there for society at large as we're all kind of isolated and spending more time at home with our loved ones? Do you think there's kind of a lesson there for all of us? Yeah, I do. I think it's it's kind of nice that we're, I mean, I, I find it funny that people feel the need to go out. It's like, or they're complaining about having to be with their family. Uh, they're not asking us to take sledgehammers and break rocks. You know, they're asking us to stay home. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where um, it forces us to kind of go back in time a little bit and be the family that's around the dinner table and that type of thing. And yeah, you know, you may be out of work right now. And so our lives typically center around work. And I think now people are realizing, hey, look, it's really centered around family. The job is just a means of income and jobs can change. 
uh, and, and companies can come and go. I mean, look at the situation. How many companies are going to be gone? Uh, you know, I think about, uh, you know, some of those restaurant workers in Manhattan that have been working at some of those steakhouses for 20, 30 years. Yeah. yeah. There's no one coming, you know? So, uh, you know, one of the, so I think sometimes we revolve our life around work and I think work just needs to fit in our life. Mm. And it's a good, it's a good reset, I think, for all of us in a lot of respects. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about this experimental, let me get back to our little double boxes. Um, yeah. I want to talk about this experimental treatment you were given while you were in that coma. What do you know about it and what did you learn when you woke up? Um, I did not actually know anything about it before. Uh, my wife and the doctors discussed all my treatment and uh, they were actually on the phone with the CDC and the WHO uh, figuring all this out. And so when I came to uh, and they were discussing with me the treatments, I was going, wow, you gave me that? Wow. Um, but it worked. Or the, the malaria drug and like an HIV. Yes. And they, they gave me, yes, right. They gave me an anti-malaria drug. They gave me an H anti-HIV uh, and one that treats AIDS patients. They were going to give me the one that, that treats Ebola patients, but I started coming out. And so they, they held off, you know, they don't want to give you as too many medications, but that cocktail, those three really helped me kind of kind of come out. And so I know now they're using it for other patients with great eff eff efficacy. So I'm glad they figured something out that worked. And I'm glad now other people are getting to benefit from it. Yeah. I mean, do we know how much that factored into your recovery or could like, I guess we'll never really know for sure. Not right? really. I, I really don't know. I know that, um, that I stabilized mm -hmm. and then was improving and they, and they were measuring my blood gases. So they had a way to measure all the gases that are going on in your blood. And so that's kind of how they know that you're improving is the fact that and then they, you know, they give you the Lasix too to, to get the fluid out of your lungs. So as they see your lungs clearing, they see the blood oxygen levels going up, the other gases going down. You know, they, that they have all that telemetry to show them, okay, we've got a guy on the up, not on the way down. So you've been so open and forthcoming with your story and you've been sharing it on a national platform. Why is this important to you to get this out there? I just want people to have hope. I want the family member that just watched their, their, you know, their husband or their son or their grandfather get taken away in the ambulance to not think it's a death sentence. I want people to know that people are coming home. There are hundreds of us every day coming home. And I, I just heard of a, a man from Stanford just, that just came home. I was so happy to hear that. Uh, the more of us that kind of get our story out there and say, yeah, I survived it. You can too. I, I think that'll still help start aligning fears. But also it's a way for all of us to remind everyone to stay home. Um, you know, these doctors and nurses are stressed. Um, I think about, you know, any unnecessary, I even think about me just driving around. Um, what if you get into a car accident? So now if you've never been, had COVID before, now you're going in with open wounds into an ER full of COVID patients. That's where you want to be, right? Uh, so anything unnecessary, you know, don't do because you, you, it, it could have a trickle down effect. Right. And so the idea is, you know, let's take the stress off the system. And then also to, uh, for those families and for any patients that are in the hospital, just keep at it, keep doing your PT, make the small progressions every day. You're gonna have a setback. I had a few, as Heidi and I discussed earlier, I had a couple myself, um, <laughs> but you just plug away. And, and as you keep fighting and keep going and making those progressions day by day, they'll, they're just gonna build and build and build on one another. And after you make a progression, call somebody that you know, um, they can't come visit you. It's a, it's a very unique time. Usually if you're in the hospital, family and friends can come visit, things like that. This is you and the hospital workers and that's it. And so um, making the most of that, making the most of your human interactions with the, the hospital staff, uh, knowing that you can come home and, and make that your focus, make that your aim. All right, I wanna get home by this date, even if that's two days later, three days later to get your double or triple negative test, that's fine. But set it in motion and go after it. And, and you can come home. You, you definitely can come home. And for the family that just had someone go in the hospital, 
your family, your loved one can come home. What is the one thing you know to be true? Health is wealth. And so you got to take care of your health. If you take care of your health, everything else will, will come out on the other, on the other end. Well, I think you're giving a lot of people hope and that's something we all need right now. Well, thank you. And I, I, you know, again, it's just a small part. Uh, the real heroes are, are, are fighting this thing every day. And, uh, if, if this can help anybody and sitting in a hospital bed, freaked out with an albuterol mask around their face, um, if it can give them encouragement or family member encouragement, um, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy the message got out. Awesome. Chris Tillett, thank you so much. So glad to see you recovering. Go love up on those babies and check <laughs> again, won't you? Yes, definitely will. Thank you, Heidi.